Hello, Quantum Village people. It's, uh, it's great to be here. So I'm Mark Jackson, and this is Catherine Spendier, and we are the Quantum Evangelists. That's actually our title at Quantinuum. How many of you have heard of Quantinuum? No. OK, good. So, um, so Quantinuum is the recent merger between Honeywell Quantum Solutions and Cambridge Quantum Computing. And so uh, we're one of the largest quantum computing companies in the world, and we're very proud to be here taking part in the world's first quantum village and quantum capture the flag competition. So there are three parts to what I want to talk to you about today. The first is just what is quantum computing? Because I think a lot of you, based on some of the discussions that we've had here in the back, don't know what quantum computing is and how amazing it is and, and what it's good for even. The second part is going to be about Ticket, which is our software development kit. Um, and, uh, and it's open source and it's free and it's available for anyone to use. And in particular, it's the basis for a lot of the challenge problems that we have set for Capture the Flag. And there might be hints and things in there. And so, uh, so I'll talk generally about what Ticket is and how it can help you. And then Catherine is going to take over and she's going to go through some examples. And again, this might be useful for some of the Capture the Flag type challenge problems. So, um, so that's what we have today for the next hour or so. And tomorrow, my colleague Thomas over there in the back, he's going to be talking about quantum natural language processing and things like that. So, uh, so let's get started. So why all this fuss about quantum computing? Why do we go to all the bother of building quantum computers like you just heard about from Oxford Quantum Circuits? It's not just because quantum computers are a faster computer. That's not it. It's because we think they will be able to do things that we never, ever could have done before. And a prime example is in chemistry. So there in the upper left-hand corner, this is my favorite molecule. This is caffeine. It's not an especially large molecule. We know what the equations are. We've known for 100 years what the equations are to simulate this on a computer. The problem is that if you put this on a computer, it would need to be about the size of the Earth to do this to figure out the chemical properties of caffeine uh, if you wanted to put this on a computer. And if you wanted a larger molecule, like penicillin there, it's not even theoretically possible. You would need a computer the size of the entire universe to do that. So clearly, normal computers have a lot of problem simulating molecules and figuring out chemical properties. Now, in contrast, quantum computers can do this with a very modest number of qubits. So a qubit is the basic ingredient in a quantum computer. It stands for quantum bit, and we spell it there with a Q. And as you've just heard, we're talking about building quantum computers with thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of qubits. So just try to think about that for a second. That's how powerful quantum computers are compared to normal computers. The amazing thing is this is not science fiction. We actually have quantum computers. So you've just heard about one. Uh, from, from OQC using superconducting technology. And this is a, a technology used by IBM and Google and several others. We have one at Continuum which uses ion trap technology. There's a photonic approach and there's many others. So we, we don't just have one method of building quantum computers. We have several, each of which has advantages and disadvantages. There's no obvious winner yet. I'm sure every person in this room has heard of Moore's Law. So we have seen over several decades that computers have doubled in power roughly every 18 months or so. Quantum computers are on a much faster trajectory. So this top line here, this shows the progress made in what's called the quantum volume, which is kind of an estimate of the power of a quantum computer. And we've been able to increase this by a factor of 10 every year. So because of this, we think that we will have commercial applications in as soon as three years. This is, this is not... 20 years from now, maybe they'll be useful. We think in just a few years, companies will be deploying quantum software to solve real world problems. So this is why we're so excited about it. And this is why we're here today to get you programming on quantum computers. This is what a quantum program looks like. I've had many people come up to me and ask, well, I'm a programmer. How can I start programming quantum computers? It is completely different. The whole logic behind programming quantum computers is based on quantum physics. And so this is how we do it. I know it kind of looks like a child's game or something, but every horizontal line represents a qubit. Every colored block represents an operation on the qubit. So we initialize them, and then we do all these operations, and we put the qubits in what are called superpositions. 
which means they're, they exist in two different configurations at the same time, or entanglement, which means the value of this qubit depends on the value of this qubit, even if they're separated. And this is a purely quantum physics effect. And then at the end of the calculation, we measure the qubits. We force them to choose, are you zero or are you one? Up until then, it's in this weird quantum state. And that's what a quantum program does. It mixes them all up so that the correct answer pops out at the end and the wrong answers get diminished. But we don't get to find out what it is until the very, very end. This is what we think we can do with a quantum computer. These are some of the applications. And I want to mention, this is probably a very incomplete list. There's probably gonna be some very smart young person who thinks of some killer app that we never would have considered before. But some of the things that we have thought of already are chemistry, like I've talked about, being able to simulate much larger molecules and figuring out what their chemical properties are. And this could be used for material science and it could be used for pharmaceutical companies when they design medicine. We could have things like supply chain scheduling and job shop scheduling and things like that, trying to find the optimal um, value of something. Obviously, there's a lot of financial implications because a lot of banks have trading algorithms based on machine learning. And so quantum machine learning is becoming its own subfield. So there's now a lot of quantum machine learning algorithms that especially financial institutions are employing for more efficient trading. And then finally, cybersecurity. And given the audience, this is probably the one thing that you know about quantum computing. It does have the capability to undo a lot of forms of encryption. Uh, maybe not today, but at some point in the future. And, and a lot of groups and government agencies are very aware of this and are already taking precautions about that. So what do we do when we program quantum computers? So at the very top level of the stack, we have applications. So these are things that companies or individuals want to solve. So these are real world problems. These in turn depend on quantum algorithms. So this is the, just like a normal algorithm, so these are kind of recipes that people have developed, but they're completely quantum. So we, we would have to swap out the classical part and replace it with a quantum part. These quantum algorithms depend on Ticket. So Ticket is the software development kit and the compiler, which interfaces between the, the different algorithms and either the hardware or the simulator that you use, because quantum computers are still pretty expensive and we don't always have easy access to a quantum computer. So oftentimes we still use simulators to do this. So, uh, so this is why we've developed Ticket. Uh, we've spent several years doing this and last year we made it open source. It's really the, the liaison between any type of quantum computer you have and any type of algorithm. And it's becoming increasingly popular. As of last night, we've had almost half a million downloads. So, so again, we've spent eight years developing this. It's now open source. It's a very widely used tool, not just at Quantinuum, of course, but all across the quantum computing field. We support nearly every quantum platform. So pretty much every quantum computer that you've ever heard of is on this list, uh, including Oxford Quantum Circuits. You see there at the bottom. There are other compilers and SDKs, but ours is by far the most universal. And we've also put a lot of emphasis in having Ticket make the most efficient execution of your code. Because especially nowadays, when we don't have that many qubits and there's still a relatively high error rate, you want to be sure to get the most power out of your software. So how does Ticket do this? How does it find the most efficient way to run your quantum software on any computer? So there's two components to this. The first component is optimizing just your quantum program, or circuit as we call it, and this has nothing to do with the hardware you're running it on. It's just your program itself. The second component is specific to the hardware you're running. So as, as you probably figured out, all these different quantum computers, they have different idiosyncrasies. Uh, they use different technology, the qubits are connected differently, they have different error rates. There's a lot of differences. Ticket is aware of all of that, so that you don't have to be. So Ticket will take all of that into account and find them the best way to run your program on that hardware that you've chosen. So to focus a little bit more on the first part here, when you, want to, when you run your program, you want to use as few operations or gates as possible because every operation takes a little time and it's another source of potential error. And so what Ticket will do is it will first go through your program and it will look for certain combinations of gates and it will try to find a simpler way to express that. So mathematically, your program is untouched. It's identical to what it was before. 
but there might be a simpler way to express that. The second part is more macroscopic. It looks for larger patterns, and again, it tries to, to just find a simpler way to do that. So here are some examples. So these are combinations of gates that Ticket will look for, and so you see that these are kind of little subcomponents of, of a larger quantum program. The simplest one up here is the upper left-hand corner, so that's two C0 operations in a row. So, it so it's, it's actually entangling these qubits twice. The funny thing is, is that this actually, one operation undoes the other. So even though you have these two operations, they actually cancel each other out, leaving the qubits untouched. So if Ticket sees this, it just removes those two gates, which means your program runs a little bit faster, and it's a little bit less likely to make an error. These other replacements are less obvious, but if you're curious, I, I published the scientific article here explaining all the mathematical theory behind this. So once it does that, then it moves on to the constraints for your hardware. So it takes into account how, it, how the qubits are connected. It takes into account the native operations on that computer, because these aren't necessarily the native operations that you would use in your program. And then some computers, including ours, have what's called mid-circuit measurement, where it can actually measure a qubit and use the result for the rest of the circuit to continue. And so Ticket knows all this for you, and it will take this into account. So here are a few examples. So these are three quantum computers by three well-known companies. They all use superconducting technology, so they have something in common. But you see that the way that the qubits are connected is very different. And these are, these are superconducting physical qubits, so they're locked into place. There's nothing you can do. So Ticket knows this, and it also knows that the, the basis gates, so the native operations on that platform, are very different. So Ticket will automatically do the configuration to map your qubits on your program into those and to map your operations into those. So for an example of how important this could be, the circuit on the right-hand side, this is a typical circuit, you'll notice that it has five qubit couplings. So the two qubits at the bottom there, they're entangled with each other as well as the top three. So there are some five qubit couplings, we say. The machine on the left, though, by, by IBM, it has at most four qubit couplings. So naively, we might think there's no way to run this program on this computer. That's not true. We actually can do that, but we have to be a little bit clever about it. What we have to do is something called routing. So we have to move the information on the qubits around. And this is a perfectly legitimate operation. We do it using something called a swap gate. And you can do that by introducing these CNOT gates, as shown here. But of course, remember what I just said. Adding more gates is what we don't want to do. We're trying to make the program smaller, not larger. And so Ticket will do this routing, but only as it needs to, to make your program work. And again, it has a built-in heuristic optimizer, so you don't need to do anything. Ticket will figure this out for you. Obviously, we use Ticket internally for our own application development, but many, many other groups use it as well. IBM uses it, Google uses it, even CERN, the physics lab in Geneva, they use it. And these are some of the articles which they've written. There have been many benchmarks done studying Ticket compared to some others. Um, this is an independent group called Arlene, and they showed that in almost every case, Ticket will make your program run faster. So, um, so we are constantly updating it, and as I mentioned, last September, we made it open source. So it's free, there are no licensing restrictions, every line of code is available for you to download and inspect. If you have a clever idea for how to improve it and make, make the optimization work better, you're absolutely welcome to contribute. If you happen to have a quantum computer in your backyard, and you want to write your own extension so that people can run software on your machine, you're absolutely welcome to write that extension, and, uh, and people have done that. We have a lot of exciting things coming up. So right now you download it from GitHub and you run it locally, but a future version will be on the cloud, and, uh, and this will be necessary as programs become larger and more sophisticated. Um, you'll need to access things like, like my, uh, Azure and AWS to do the compilation and such. So this is how you download it. If you'd like to take a screenshot, I would encourage you to do so. So this is the, the GitHub repo. It's, uh, it's completely straightforward. So that's how you would do it. There are some examples and notebooks and things to help you get started. Catherine is going to talk a lot more about that in a second. And you install it just using the usual pip install. It's, uh, it's completely straightforward. So you install PyTicket, so that's the Python version of that. 
plus whatever hardware you think you might use, whether it's IBM or Google's or Oxford Quantum Circuits or, or anything like that. And you can install as many as you'd like, of course. Um, it's up to you. And so, um, so that's a very quick summary of quantum computing and of Ticket. And uh, if, if you have any questions, I, by all means, uh, please email me. Um, and so now Catherine is going to talk about Ticket in more detail, and she's going to go through some examples of how you can get started and learning to program. And again, this is a fantastic opportunity. If you've ever wanted to learn quantum programming, I would encourage you to do so. We've set a lot of challenge problems up, some easy and some less easy. And, uh, and we'll have a prize at the very end. And, uh, and we'll actually keep the competition open uh, even after DEF CON is over to encourage people to do that. So, uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Catherine. Thank you, Mark. Hello? Okay, great. Okay, it takes a little bit of time to connect. Okay, great. So, hello, everyone. So, I am here to help you get started um, at the CTF, right? So, how many of you have now logged into and signed up for the CTF? Okay, a few of you. Great, awesome. So, please do so. Go uh, to Quantum Village, sign up for the CTF, um, and you are able to um, try out the first time, probably, to do a quantum circuit and how to code it and then play around with it. So, I am here uh, this weekend. I'm going to be your ticket um, point of contact. And um, for the ticket specific challenges, uh, please find me. I'll be in the back there. And I can give you specific technical uh, guidance on it. Okay. So first of all, um, as Mark already uh, mentioned, um, ticket is kind of like the liaison between the hardware and different quantum languages you have. For example, Qiskit or Circ or so on. And then we can access different hardware with ticket for example, the OQC, which are here today. So if we can do this, this will be great. So anyways, to get started with Ticket, what you have to do is you have to, uh, first of all, have your Python environment set up. Uh, I would suggest you're going to do 3.9 or th uh, 3.10, OK, if you set up the Python. Um, then what you do, do is you want to do a pip install by Ticket, OK? So sorry, I apologize here. There's a, a typo. I'm going to take this out right now. <laughs> um, so you're going to do a pip install by ticket. Okay? This is going to uh, install the latest version of uh, by ticket. I think it's 1.15. Then um, if you want to start uh, doing a quantum circuit uh, in by ticket, what you want to do is you want to uh, import the circuit class. Okay? And then you want to uh, define your circuit. And you do a circuit with the number of qubits. There's going to be a challenge questions in there. So go look at the uh, information about uh, how you do circuits and buy a ticket. Um, and then uh, you can actually, one of the multiple choice questions is going to be on this. So maybe I should um, expand here a little bit on it. So you have ticket, which is the compiler, right? The quantum software development kit. And buy ticket is the Python language package for you to use, right? So, so ticket is pretty much the C++ that goes into the Pi ticket. So in any case, um, I will use it kind of ticket and Pi ticket um, interchangeably, so make sure that you understand that Pi ticket is just a Python package. So in any case, um, how many of you know uh, what a qubit is? Okay, some of you. Okay, good. So, <laughs> so you have a classical qubit, right? A classical bit with a zero, one, and a qubit is typically something that um, um, is on a block sphere. So how many of you know what the block sphere is? A few of you. Okay, so maybe I should show this. I figured I should probably have a picture of a block sphere. So this is a block sphere. And typically on the poles, you have the state, in this base, the C basis, which is a zero, and the one basis, uh, the C basis up is a zero. So imagine you have a vector pointing out that would be zero, and a vector pointing down on a block sphere, that would be one. 
And in quantum computing, what you have, you have a vector, right? That can be in any of these positions on this block sphere. It can be up, down, uh, it could be on the x or y axis, but you can have it in any phase, any phase, anywhere on this block sphere. And so this is the very unique thing about quantum computing. You just don't have zero and one, you have all the states in between, okay? And that makes quantum computing super cool. So when you are, um, when you are doing quantum computing, what you're doing more or less is you are starting with a state in your block sphere. You are like maybe initializing into a new series state, and then you apply quantum computing algorithms or co like your ideas, and then you start to rotate your um, state on this block sphere. And then eventually you're gonna measure it. You're gonna measure the state on this block sphere. And that's then your output. But you cannot only do it once, you have to do it many, 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 many times. You have to do it like a thousand times in order to get your answer or like more than that because it's all probabilistic. So quantum computing is a probabilistic um, idea. It's not just deterministic, right? So you have to run it many, many times. So in any case, what you do when you do a quantum circuit, you play with this vector on a block sphere, right? You're like swishing around, moving around, do your computation, and then eventually you're gonna measure it. You're gonna measure the the values of your block sphere. Anyways, um, I don't want to give too much away, but you're going to have to learn the block sphere, and you're going to have to learn how to do vectors, <laughs> and you're going to have to know what a vector is, absolute value of it, you know, in order to measure it and understand what the value is of a qubit. So this, I'm going to give you a way that. So um, yes, so this is what I want to do. So in any case, uh, the understanding now that you're on a block sphere, um, what you want to do, is you want to develop a circuit, right? So you have a circuit class. And then what you want to do is you want to start to rotate the circuit. So you want to rotate your, your vector, right? So for example, you have different types of gates. So you can have an Rx gate, an Rc gate, an X0 gate. Um, and each of these gates does something different. For example, the Rx gate has an X rotation of a angle pi on the block sphere. It's just imagine your block sphere again, and then you would um, start at a zero state, and then you would uh, rotate around the X axis by an angle of pi, right? So it's all rotation. So you can also rotate about the C axis and X naught. This is a gate, and I'm gonna show you a circuit soon, where you actually can uh, connect the qubits. So here I'm connecting and entangling two qubits. I'm entangling qubit zero and entangling qubit two. So in any case, this is how you compare a circuit. Uh, then you can measure your circuit. Because in quantum uh, computing, if you don't measure your circuit, you have not accomplished what you wanted. So you have to measure your circuit. You also make sure that this is uh, in your code when you do this. So here now, um, I'm showing you a circuit which I just made. So initialized your, it's a three uh, qubit circuit. Um, the first qubit we rotated uh, in around the c-axis by um, a quarter of pi. Here we uh, rotated around the x-axis by pi. And then here, this is your x naught gate, so we're connecting qubit zero and qubit two. These are now entangled. So this is a very, very simple circuit, right? You can explore during the CTF. You're gonna be exploring more and more complicated circuits. And then what you see here, what Mark already said, so this is one, uh, these horizontal lines are your qubits, and then you have your classical register. So what is the idea of a classical register? Why do we need a classical register? Right, so we have to measure the state of a qubit, and for that we need a classical mesh register. So when you're in any kind of language, doesn't matter if you use ticket, you use circ, um, or you use qiskit, you're gonna have this measure function. You're gonna have to apply it to your circuit, okay? And then to do that, then eventually you're actually able to um, read out the state of a given qubit in your classical register, okay? So this is what this little uh, measure uh, button is, what it shows you and that now you know we measured your system. So now how do you run a circuit? So this I showed you how to do develop a circuit. You can do only kind of different gates. Again, I would, uh, for the uh, CTF, uh, I go out there and learn about different, what different gates do, right, on, their, on your block sphere. Learn about what does a Hadamard gate do? What does a um, CX gate do? And so on, right? So uh, learn about this and make your circuits depending on the challenge questions. Then how do you run a circuit? So there's different ways of um, running a circuit. Um, first of all, what a lot of people are doing is you're running on simulators, right, classical simulators, but you can also run it on the back end. 
Okay. So if you want to explore, so we have um, um, our Lucy available for you, right? So you can try to figure out how to run circuits on Lucy, right? Um, or how many of you have heard about IBM? Some of you. So you can, uh, for example, set up an IBM Q account, right? And there you don't have uh, access to their backends. So anyways, you can do simulators or you can do IB, um, uh, backends just like uh, Lucy or for IBQ, uh, IBM. Or you can use um, um, Azure. Um, how many of you know uh, Amazon Bracket? Some of you. If you're interested in accessing uh, quantum computers through Amazon, you can also set up a Bracket account. Okay? And then uh, Microscope Azure has also uh, uh, access for you to quantum computers. So just check out so IBM Q. Uh, uh, Microsoft are sure they all have access, but today I would tell you, please uh, try to get access to Lucy. Um, um, I know Lucy is on some of them too, right? Um, one of the like I think Bracket and Azure, I be believe so. Uh, but you have access to Lucy today, so please do that. Anyways, um, if you want to do the, um, if you want to get a hold of IBM, for example, then uh, what you would install, you would install uh, bib install. Buy ticket Kiskit. So buy ticket can go with Kiskit, buy ticket um, Circ, right? Buy ticket Bracket, buy ticket Assure, buy ticket um, OCQ. This is how we get the different backends. So this is the call you want to look for. Um, and I will show you then a little bit of a documentation uh, where you can go and explore. Anyways, then you have to do different extensions. You have to do a little bit of coding here. And here right now we take the air backend from IBM. This is a simulator. It will simulate your circuit, right? How you can run it. So anyways, you run this code um, and then you can um, uh, simulate your circuit. In this case, I simulated it. So here you have the number of shots. So you can do it a couple of times. So maybe it's too much. Let's do 2,000 shots here. Okay, we're gonna try to implement our circuit we made, right? So it's a three qubit circuit. So what are the outcomes, right? Each of these qubits could be a zero or one because we're measuring in the C basis, right? For so the qubit zero, you could have a zero one. For qubit one, you can have a zero one. For qubit two, you can have a zero one, right? So your measurement could be zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, one, and so on, right? You still have so many different, um, um, you have three to the n different, uh, um, two to the three different uh, options, right? Um, you can have, so the two to the three is how much? Eight. Okay, good. So you have eight different solutions you could have, right? In any case, you can run this now and um, go ahead. And in this case, when you run it, so I'm doing uh, 2,000 shots, if I can read right. I run it, and now we'll see it takes a little bit, I think. Uh, no? And then we do print counts. So now you see, right? So this specific way, this circuit uh, gave you 1,000 shots for 000, 000 and uh, 991 shots on 010, right? So if you would go in here now, I'm just playing around because we can do that, right? Um, so for example, we can uh, do another one. What have we not done? Uh, let's put a Hadamard Hada gate on qubit two just for fun. So we go up here, and then we're gonna do uh, here. We're gonna do a circ. Uh, oopsie, a Hadamard gate, and we're gonna put it on qubit two, right? So now I'm gonna run it. So here, this is a way of output. Uh, now we're going to render it. You do circuit mesh here all. OK, so here now you see uh, what happened. Did we see the Hadama gate? Oh, I probably have to, sorry about this. I probably have to just run it again. Let's run it again. OK. So you see here now is the Hadamard gate. It's, it's, it's right here, right? So we have added the Hadamard gate. So after we did the rotations and we did the X naught commission, so entangled qubit zero and two, we then applied the Hadamard gate. So that's what I want to tell you too, when you do these circuits, be careful how you uh, code the gates, right? Because they're gonna be added along on your circuit, right? So even though we wanted to maybe initialize um, the Hadamard gate at the beginning, uh, we can do it the other, uh, you have to be careful about the um, yeah, sequence you apply a gate. Okay, that makes sense? So, um, so for example, if you would want to do the Hadamard gate here at the beginning, you would have to um, make sure that it's one of the first calls in your circuit class. 
Okay, anyways, so now we can run this circuit again and see if we get a different out outcome. See, now we got a total different outcome, right? We added one gate, right, the Hadamard gate, which puts the specific qubit in into superposition. So it, a Hadamard gate, what it does, it, it puts the qubit into a superposition between um, the, uh, the, like the zero and the, the one state. So you have the 50% chance of being in a one state and a 50% of chance being in a zero state. But now just um, looking at the um, program here, you now can see, right, uh, we got more answers, right? So more qubit, um, uh, so we have a zero, one, zero with 500 uh, shots, zero, zero with around 500 shots, zero, zero, one with 475 shots, and zero, one, one, one with uh, 472 shots, right? Um, typically, these simulators have seeds, so depending on which seed you're using, you may get the same answer, but a different seed, you get a different answer, right? So be also aware of that, that seeds are very important um, uh, to choose from. And it is what I haven't done here now. We could run this on a backend, but in order to, uh, for, to run it on a backend, you're going to need an uh, API, right? You need some account information. You need to have an API token, um, and then you can uh, code that in. So if you have questions about how to do that, uh, you can go and just Google uh, PyTicket manual, okay? So it's very important for your CTF. Go online, Google PyTicket manual, and there you can go through um, and we'll tell you about uh, how to construct a circuit, right? Um, it goes through everything, how you construct a circuit. My mouse is super sensitive, but it's all right there. So for the CTF, uh, I suggest go to PyTicket manual and go ahead and do that, right? Um, the other one is, um, so as Mark uh, mentioned before, um, Honeywell Quantum and uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing, they merged, right? So um, all the ticket to um, like um, the ticket tutorials and ticket um, um, documentation, a lot you're also going to find on the CQCL uh, GitHub page. Okay, if you go there, you're going to have buy ticket. You can click on examples, and here you're also going to have some uh, pretty neat examples: circuit analysis, circuit generation, compilation, how to run a different backends. Okay, so everything is out there for the CTF for the ticket examples, right? Um, you learn how to go between Qiskit and Ticket, between the IBM um, um, uh, Python language, Qiskit, and how to go to Ticket, right? You will learn how to compile to different end uh, backends. You will learn how to optimize circuits, turn to CTF, so uh, stuff Mark mentioned earlier, OK? So in any case, um, here's the technical part of it. Um, Look at this, uh, look at the buy ticket examples, go to the manual we have um, for you available online, um, and then um, work it out, okay? Make your first quantum circuit, play around with it, um, use a simulator. Uh, it is up to you to um, now create and have fun with this, okay? And find me. Happy hacking. <laughs> you want to say something?